Good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. morning. Man, we are continuing this series on uh, living beyond fears, and today's, um, I've honestly been struggling with how to put it into words all week, um, and I'm just going to, I'm going to put it out there and see if it resonates, because I, I may not have got there yet, and it's, it's simply the fear of not mattering. Do I matter? Am I worth anything? Um, we just did worship. It was it was it was a great time. It, it's it's always a time that feels like it kind of recalibrates me to my true north, and and I recognize who God is, and I recognize who I am. And um, worship actually comes from two root words. One is worth, value, and then the ship part is we give that to God. And so we've sat and we've said, you know what, God, you matter to us. We hold you in high esteem. We hold you in high value. Um, and that whole valuing something and being valued is important, not uh, just to God, but I think that it's built into us to need to matter and to make a difference. Um, Mother Teresa once said the worst disease that she ever came across while she was treating the, the sick and dying in Calcutta was the disease of feeling like a nobody. And um, I think there are moments in our lives where when we pause it and we reflect and we go, man, I'm really small and I just don't know if I matter. Um, I had a season in my life uh, where it was after a really uh, rough ministry time, and I decided that I don't even know if I want to be a pastor anymore yet. That was the only thing I was trained to do. So I got some seasonal work. I was working at Amazon, and I was uh, running around doing inventory during the uh, Christmas season, and uh, all concrete floors, hard, hard work, and I could feel my body breaking down and going, man, I, I can't keep doing this. I'm glad this is seasonal, but I can't keep doing this. And um, and then on Christmas Day, my dog was chasing a ball and messed up her leg really bad. She had to get surgery, and they said, well, she can't go upstairs. She needs to be uh, looked after and all this stuff. And so, and it was the end of my Amazon time. And so I ended up with an eight-week stretch where uh, I sat at home, and as I talked with friends, and as I met people, they go, well, what is it you do? And I said, well... Um, I'm a dog nanny. <laughs> they go, oh, is that a business? Like, and I, no, one dog. <laughs> this one in our house. And, uh, and meanwhile, Christina's career was taking off, and she's saying, we're okay. Financially, we're going to get through this. And I, but I was sitting around going, I'm just a big burden. Like, the only person that I'm added to right now is Jack. Or a woman. Um, I didn't feel like I had any worth. Um, now, Jesus' culture was one of um, horrible poverty. People in rough, rough times, and, and they had been overtaken by the Romans, and the way the Romans um, financed all of this taking over was through heavy taxation. So you had poor people who were being taxed really heavily, and, um, and Jesus is looking out at this crowd of people who feel incredibly small. And uh, I want to read for you two scriptures. And it's Matthew 10, 29 to 31 is the first one. Although, you know what? I'm going to set Matthew 1 to four aside. Just for now. Um, I can't have that long out. Okay. Um, and he gets at this question of, of do people matter? And he says, um, he says this. Are not two sparrows sold for a penny? Now, a penny, smallest coin, similar um, to our culture. Smallest coin, are two sparrows sold for a penny, and yet not one of them would fall to the ground apart from the will of your father. In other words, God is, actually cares about those sparrows. He is watching out for them. Um, even the very hairs on your head are numbered. Who cares about you enough to count the hairs on your head? Um, so don't be afraid. You're worth more than sparrows. Um, now, there is a, a, a similar text. It's actually a, a, a parallel text in Luke, and I want to read it for you because it brings out a, a little, little interesting thing. Luke 12, uh, 6 and 7. It says, Are not five sparrows sold for two pennies, yet not one of them is forgotten by God. Indeed, the very hairs of your head are all numbered. Don't be afraid to work more than sparrows. You see, in the marketplace, you can buy 
these little sparrows. I don't even know if they were actually sparrows uh, for you bird ecologists. I don't know what the proper term is. But, a what? Ornithologists. Ornithologists, yes. <laughs> they may not be actual sparrows, but uh, these birds were plentiful and they would roost in everything. And if you were a reporter, you could buy uh, two of these, bring as an offering to the Lord. Um, the other thing that you could do with them was um, cook them up and you would have one little mouthful of food. Um, and so this was, these were available, readily available. As a matter of fact, they were so available that if you got, if you bought four, for two pennies, you got the fifth one first. Um, I go firework shopping. Uh, that's already been told. There's going to be a large amount of fireworks at my place. But um, every year I also go up to Boom City. And if you start to get high value items, they start pulling a side bag. And they go, oh, I can throw in some of these. And I'll throw in some of these. These are the little stuff. The little poppers and the little sparklers. And they just, just throw it in a bag because it's pretty much worthless. Um, and there are moments, I feel like, that we look around, or we look at the sum of our life, and we wonder, am I that fifth sparrow that just gets thrown in for free, that, that extra stuff, that added stuff? Um, and it comes up in weird moments. You're having a conversation with somebody, and, and they don't remember meeting you before, but you remember meeting them. You go, oh. Or all your friends get invited to a party, and you're like, oh, I got left off the list this time. Um, these things bug us because we go, man, do I not matter to them anymore? Um, this mattering matters um, a great deal. Oh, I didn't even think of that. But mattering matters. Okay. Um, parents do this. Uh, I, I've done some youth ministry. I got to hang out with lots of parents. Parents look at their kids, and I think one of the reasons why parents are so hard on their kids and like thought, well, isn't that they're just hoping for a college scholarship? They want to see their son somehow succeed, and, and the son of their son's life impacts them. Did I do something right? Did, do I matter? My legacy. Um, millionaires go, I gotta set up a foundation, I gotta make a difference. Um, entrepreneurs look at their business and they go, Man, if it's succeeding, then I'm doing great. And if it's failing right now, value goes down. Um, educators point to their students and say, Man, I, I made a difference. At least for some of um, Pastors, it's weird when we get together. Really weird. We should be the most valued people on the planet. We hang out with God. We, we preach the gospel day in and day out. And yet, what do we do? We get together and we go, how many people are in your church? Uh, what's your budget? And uh, it isn't just for this sheer curiosity of how can we help one another in ministry. It's, there's this sense of like, well, I've got to measure up. i got to somehow. And, and if I'm the important person in the room, lots of people come to me. And if I'm not, Nobody knows. And uh, we do weird things like we drop names in conversations. You ever run across that? Oh, yeah, yeah, I, I know this guy, and, and he knows that guy, and that guy's really important. And, and somehow, like, oh, um, all of this stuff comes up with value. Um, I think, honestly, sports gets involved with this. I'm a huge sports fan. Seahawks fans walk around taller when the Seahawks play well. See, I got my Seahawks hat, I got my jacket, and now I'm a part of something. I'm a part of something good. I'm a winner. Um, Mariners fans are starting to do that. It's weird. Because <laughs> the guy who's lived here too long. Um, advertising totally puts in this. If you wear the right name, the right stuff, and drive the right car, well, then somehow you feel better than me every day. Yo, um, it's kind of the marketing foot. There's this fantastic little children's book. Um, sometimes I like children's books because they're not complicated. They get the message across in a way that I can I can sit in and, and just get. There's this great children's book called You Are Special. Um, and it's by Max Lucado. And uh, he describes these little wooden people, a society of little wooden people, and they walk around with a box of gold stars and gray dots. And they give them to one another as a way of saying value. And um, it's actually kind of how our society runs out there. So, yeah. so I brought some of these, and I want to show you kind of what they do, because I really think that it's what we do in our culture. So they grab a few of these, and they, they walk around, and they look at each other, and go, ooh, you're pretty. <laughs> yeah, I didn't uh, say that right earlier. You're a great dog. <laughs> um, Karen, you played a masterful bass. <laughs> you get a star. 
I can't, I don't even have the heart to give out great God. <laughs> oh, come on, pick somebody. John? What have you been doing this month? I haven't seen you at all. <laughs> so we do this, we run around and we give away our stars. I had you all laughing. <laughs> We do this, and this is how we get our value. Um, and the truly, I think, terrifying question to all of us is this. What if my gray dots outweigh my stars? What if um, I end up feeling worthless and other people find out I'm worthless too? And what happens when we build up this sense of value on something and then it's not there anymore. I was so proud to be a church planner when I planted the well. And then when the well closed, all of a sudden I had to go, man, what does that make me now? I guess it makes me a failed church planner. Um, what happens when we retire? We built this whole pile of career, and now it's gone. Um, how do we handle those seasons? There's this um, interesting character in Napoleon Dynamite, one of my favorite movies. If you haven't seen it, go rent it, because it's just, it's quirky and it's fun and it's beautiful. But there's this character named Uncle Rico. And um, Uncle Rico was a really, really good football player in high school, but now he's like 30-something. And what Uncle Rico does every day is get up and watch the tape of his high school game when he won the championship. And then he goes outside of his little RV, and then he sets up a video camera, and he takes video of himself throwing footballs. And his plan is to send these videos off so that he can get another shot at Maverick. He's stuck. No hope for the future, like um, Susie was mentioning, because the only time he had value was back then. What happens when the gray dots pile up in our lives? What happens when we actually feel like we don't matter? Um, and by the way, there's a part of Christian culture that just drives me batty around this. And that's our inability to actually receive a compliment. Guilty as charged. I do that too. My wife will try to give me compliments. I'm like, ah, no. Well, that was Jesus. That wasn't me. Um, but we get this thing where we go, no, I'm, I'm a sinner, but there's no way I'm a of any value and I guess it's Jesus at work. Um, the only sort of strength I might have or gifting I might have is the work of the Holy Spirit, which it's a partnership there. But I think we cycle ourselves around this idea that we don't matter and that we aren't valued. What happens when all of this piles up, uh, when we get unfriended, when we have a conversation with somebody and they uh, leave us behind? Uh, my mom, uh, had a season where she had to stop working because she was disabled. And I remember her sitting around and going, well, what am I now? I guess I'm just a bird. Um, we don't have it all together. We get humbled. We fall off this pillar. Um, and when this happens, we start to do some weird, weird things. Um, any of you watching the NBA Finals? Oh, yeah. Am I the only sports fan? Oh, good. I have a review. Um, if one of those guys were to go to the line and the entire time go, there's no way I'm going to make this shot. I'm a horrible free throw shooter. What do you think is going to happen? They'll find a way to miss. Um, if somebody goes into an interview and goes, yeah, I'm not hireable, for whatever reason, the entire time that they are going into this interview, they begin to go, in that interview, they have a horrible chance of getting that job. Because they're going to somehow make a way for this talent. If we get into a relationship and we go, man, they probably won't like me unless I do this, this, and this to make them happy, we will make all sorts of compromises for ourselves in order to somehow receive some acceptance because we're convinced that we're not loved. This sense of value, if we don't have it, ends up making us feel like we are worthless, and then it will poison the water in which we live, and we will prove to ourselves that somehow we're worthless. 
Jesus does something absolutely radical and crazy and refocuses our life and rebuilds our lives. Um, mm-hmm. It's a totally different foundation. Our foundation for value, if we build it on all the stuff that we're doing, or on whether or not people like us, or any number of other things, um, it ends up being a foundation that can shift. We talked about that. What happens if I retire and I've made my career and my value? I went to South Carolina. Cool place, by the way. Go visit, please. Um, I went there, and the craziest thing is they got these houses, but they're way up on stilts. Way, way up on stilts. And and I was there when it wasn't stormy at all, and I'm going, that seems dumb. Why would I want to look up 20 stairs to get to my house? Um, is it just because you need your house to be taller or what? And they go, no, 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 no. When, when the hurricanes come or the storms come and the water floods in, the water just shoots right under the house. It doesn't actually wreck the house. And I go, well, that's early. And Jesus does something like that with us. Um, if we build our house on the shifting sand of importance around all this other stuff, do I wear the right name? Do people like me? Do I drive the right car? Am I successful in the eyes of everyone else? Am I admiring other people? Do I get enough stars given to me by others? Um, then what we end up with is this life that can get shifted all sorts of ways. Um, and Jesus comes in and he sort of puts our house up on stilts and goes, no. Your value is actually much higher than what anybody else can give you. Um, in the story that Max uh, wrote, the main character, uh, Punchinello, comes along and he meets somebody who has no dots and no stars on him. And it's because this person goes and spends time with the woodworker. And as they listen to the woodworker give them value, the dots and the stars begin to fall off because they just don't matter. Um, I grew up in the era of positive thinking and self-esteem. Those were two of the like big things in the 80s for me. And um, But they're paper thin alternatives because positive thinking, you go, well, I was thinking really positively, but it didn't turn out positive. Now what? And self-esteem was sort of like, well, at least I think I'm awesome. <laughs> I don't know if that amounts to anything. And yet, yet God gives us something much more... Fundamental, and so I'm going to lay out a couple pieces of the building block of the foundation. Okay, Genesis one, um, Genesis one, day one, day two, day three. God speaks. He says, "You know what? Let there be light. Bam, light appears. Let there be this. Let there be that, and reality comes into being." And then Genesis one, twenty six and twenty seven. I got to read it for you. It's so. You think after all these years I could hold a Bible and a microphone? But apparently not. Um, Genesis 1 26 and 27 says this. And then God said, Let us make man in our image, in our likeness, and let them rule over the fish of the sea and the birds of the air and over the livestock and over all the earth and over all the creatures that move along the ground. And so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. You were made in the image of God. That means God's immense value that we just sang about is actually part of your man. You are made in his image. And because of that, no matter what your situation, you'll have tremendous value. Um, the psalmist began to, to grapple with this. Psalm 8, let me read it for you. Getting in the first today. All right. Psalm 8. What is man that you're mindful of? What is the son of man that you would even care for him? And yet you made him a little lower than the heavenly beings. You crowned him with glory and honor. Psalm 139, um, 14 and 15 says, We are fearfully and wonderfully made. You are a masterpiece. You were crafted by God. You're a one of a kind, unique piece of work, and God doesn't make mistakes. That's who we are. And because of that, our value has skyrocketed. One of my favorite shows um, is, sadly, uh, Pawn Stars. Any of you ever watch Pawn Stars? So these people bring stuff in, and they go, 
You know, I have this Bible. It was used by the actual John Westfall as he was preaching once. Because I handed it to him right before he was about to preach. And um, it was used by him. And so, therefore, I, I think that it's going to be worth at least $1,500. And they bring it in. They go, uh, yeah, I want to sell this. And then they go, well, we need to authenticate it first. So they bring in their expert. And the expert comes in. He looks at it. And he goes, yeah. That actually says Chris Wilkerson on the inside. It doesn't say John Westfall. That's not a unique, authentic John Westfall Bible. Um, it's not worth near as much as you say. And whatever that guy decides is what the value is. And then they negotiate with it. So they go, well, it's actually worth 50 bucks. And then they go, well, will you take 40 for it? You know, how about 45? And then they eventually decide. But the value of that item is whatever the master says. Your value, our value, the value of every person that we meet is exactly what God says, because God creates reality. He sets the standard and decides, and when he says it, that's what it is. We can decide differently, we can disagree with him, but it doesn't actually change the value. Um, and God has said, you have a tremendously high value. Um, in Matthew 12, Jesus is sitting around the synagogue, and uh, there's this guy, and he's, he's, he's got a hand that's crippled. It's been like this for a very, very long time. And, and Jesus says, you know what? Just stretch out your hand. And so the guy does it. He stretches out his hand. And, and the rulers of the day get really, really mad at him because they go, it's the Sabbath. You're not supposed to work. And you're a healer. And you're working on the Sabbath. And you go, man, these guys are ridiculous. But and Jesus tells them a story. He says, you know what? If any of you were out in farming and your donkey fell into a pit or your sheep fell into uh, a pit, wouldn't you go and take it out? And they go, well, yeah. And he goes, well, this guy is actually worth much more than a donkey or a sheep. It's made in God's image. It's a person. That gives him immense, immeasurable value. And we totally get this. We don't even need the Bible to get this. If I commit murder, I will get a bigger sentence than if I kill a dog. I won't do either, I promise. Um, we abhor slavery. Slavery is flat out wrong. And yet, having a work animal that can't just run free and do whatever it wants, nobody would be deeply offended by that. Um, and when things get really unhealthy, when somebody um, is sociopathic, then you see child abuse and elder abuse and suicide and depression and all these things. The average healthy person goes, oh no, of course people have that. Um, Jesus does something even more radical. Today we're going to have communion. And um, Jesus was sitting there with his disciples. And he said, you know what? Um, you guys, I'm going to have to go to the cross. I'm going to have to die in order that people be saved. And in doing so, he said, get this. Human beings' value is actually as valuable as my life, God's life. Priceless. Your value is that of Jesus Christ. That's an incredibly mind-blowing thought. It's not about what you accomplish. It's not about what you wear. It's not about whether you're strong or smart or whether people give you stars or whether people give you dots. Um, you have a measurable worth and value because Jesus has decided so. So why would this matter? How does that play out in our life if we set this as the foundation rather than uh, the piling up of stuff and engaging each other? Um, the first thing is that we no longer have to play the game. You don't have to worry about whether or not you're getting stars or dots. You're actually free to just be you and be with God and to let him give you value. Um, and then we are suddenly free to go, oh, my job isn't to try to get stars from everybody and avoid the dots. My job is actually to try to remind every person that I meet that they have a measurable value, whether they succeed or not. The second thing that it does is it takes us out of this game of comparing ourselves to others. And comparison can eat you alive. 
I um, really wanted to get really good at volleyball at one point. It was my focus. It was my uh, God, so to speak. And um, I was missing school regularly to try to play more volleyball. And I wanted to be the best volleyball player in my school. And then I think that I was the best volleyball player in my school. So by then I'm starting to play with college players. And I'm going, well, now I want to be the best against them. And I went and played that. The problem was there was always somebody better. And I always go, man, I'm not good enough yet. No matter how much we pile up, if we're living in this game of comparison, we will find a way to feel like we don't measure up. Or we'll feel like we need to push somebody else down in order to feel like we somehow have that. Um, third way that this changes things is we can walk through whatever circumstance we go through and recognize you and I have immense value. And then suddenly, when the storms come, you're not shaking. You know you're right. Because God has deemed you worth dying for. So I want to leave you with some challenges. And the first is this. Find somebody who doesn't get shown value often enough and show them some things about them. Show them that you appreciate something about them. Um, second one. Recognize your own value. We uh, do these tape recordings in our head of all of our failures. The gray dots, for whatever reason, seem to speak louder. If I get two compliments or two, two comments on my sermon after this, and one of them is, Chris, that was a great sermon. And the other one is, man, you missed it. No, it's horrible. <clears throat> Guess which one I'm going to think about for the next three weeks. <clears throat> the gray dots speak so much louder. So here's my challenge. Give yourself a break. Stop playing the tape recorder on repeat that says you somehow have blown it at some point in your life and that you don't matter and that you are somehow less because of that. And instead, maybe play a recording of God saying, you're worth dying for. You live to be me. Um, last one. Spend some time with God. The crazy thing is, as we spend time with God, this, this sense of not having value and we need to measure ourselves in comparison to others begins to fade away. Um, the stickers do begin to fall off, and we don't care about them near as much because we're regularly getting a message from God that we're with 